the 43rd Regiment of Foot, warned his non-commissioned officers and privates, any man found guilty of sending the Negroes of the regiment, plundering or marauding the smallest article from the houses of the inhabitants will be severely punished. Captain Ewald, who joined Cornwallis on June 21st after recovering from a wounded leg, discovered his Jaeger detachment possessed more than 20 horses and that, quote, almost every Jaeger had his Negro, end quote. With professional pride, Ewald scribbled in his diary, but within 24 hours, I brought everything back on the track again. Ewald also noted, however, that in other units, quote, this order was not strictly carried out, end quote, and the greatest abuse arose from this arrangement, end quote. The no-nonsense Hessian officer blamed the situation on what he called the indulgent character of Lord Cornwallis. In reality, the Earl made repeated efforts to control his black camp followers and keep them from undermining his troops' discipline and his army's ability to respond to any threat. Although military expedience governed the Earl's treatment of Virginia slaves, he did betray a glimmer of sympathy for the runaways. In late July 1781, Thomas Nelson, uh, Virginia's newly installed governor, sent Cornwallis a rather curious letter. Nelson wrote, the frequent applications that are made to me by the citizens of this commonwealth to grant flags, meaning flags of truce, for the recovery of their Negroes and other property taken by the troops under your command, induce me to address your lordship for information whether restitution will be made at all, what species of property will be restored, and who may expect to be the object of such an Intelligence. Cornwallis replied with a polite but carefully worded note that must have given Nelson little satisfaction. No Negroes have been taken by the British troops by my orders nor to my knowledge, but great numbers have come to us from different parts of the country. Being desirous to grant any indulgence to individuals that I think consistent with my public duty, any proprietor not in arms against us, or holding an office of trust under the authority of Congress, and willing to give his parole that he will not in future act against his majesty's interest, will be indulged with permission to search the camp for his Negroes and take them if they are willing to go with him. Always a catch. By the summer of 1781, Lord Cornwallis's new strategy of conquest bore a strong resemblance to the hard war policies that another invading army would adopt to pacify the American South eight decades later. In his own way, Cornwallis taught the Old Dominion the same lesson that Major Generals William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Henry Sheridan would administer to the Confederacy during the Civil War. A century after Cornwallis's Virginia campaign, Sheridan captured the essence of that lesson in his memoirs. Death is popularly considered the maximum of punishment in war, but it is not. Reduction to poverty brings prayers for peace more surely and more quickly than does the destruction of human life, as the selfishness of man has demonstrated in more than one great conflict. Cornwallis' impromptu version of hard war was steadily forcing Virginia to its knees. The startling mobility of the Earl's army denied local continental forces the opportunity to engage in either conventional or guerrilla warfare. Cornwallis' policy of property desperation also neutralized Virginia's last remaining line of defense, the militia. The strength and speed of British forces terrified Virginia citizen soldiers. Militiamen grew reluctant to take up arms lest they provoke the Redcoats into destroying their homes. The militiamen also feared to leave their families alone with their slaves. There were forcible reasons which detained the militia at home, explained Edmund Randolph, a Virginia congressman. The helpless wives and children were at the mercy of not only of the males among the slaves, but of the very women who could handle deadly weapons. And those could not have been left in safety in the absence of all authority of the masters and union among the neighbors. At this critical juncture, the swiftness of Cornwallis's movements made it impossible for Virginia state government to function. On June 3, 1781, the British cavalry raided the Virginia Assembly at Charlottesville, capturing seven legislators and forcing Governor Jefferson and the rest of the assemblymen to scatter for safety. I mean, the map shows the lunge out here to, uh, out to Charlottesville. Seven mile ride through the heart of Virginia. Uh, remember what happened in 75 when uh, 
uh, British forces tried to march 20 miles uh, from Boston to Concord, Massachusetts, and back again. They don't run into, they don't run into that, kind of, that kind of opposition. They don't run into any kind of opposition. I mean, the hero of the hour is the guy who told Jefferson to run away. <laughs> very different kind of, very different kind of response than what we saw earlier in the war in a different part of the country. Uh, so. Um, so they, they capture seven legislators and then force Jefferson and the rest of the assemblymen to, to scatter for safety. Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton took some members of the assembly at Charlottesville, Cornwallis boasted, and destroyed there and on his return 1,000 stand of good arms, some clothing and other stores, and between four and 500 barrels of gunpowder without opposition. In addition to Jefferson, many other well-known Virginians, such as Richard Henry Lee, Edmund Pendleton, and George Mason, fled at the Redcoats' approach, depriving the Patriot cause of some, of some of its best political leaders. Denied the protection of a skittish state government, lacking any hint of aid from the Continental Congress or America's French allies, and facing the prospect of economic disaster, the people of Virginia began to consider making peace with Great Britain. The inhabitants of Norfolk, Princess Anne, and Nansmond counties placed themselves under British protection. The men of Montgomery, Bedford, and Prince Edward counties ignored all summons for militia duty. When state officials tried to raise the militia in Accomack, Northampton, and Lancaster counties, they encountered opposition from armed mobs. Farmers living around the British base at Portsmouth started trading with the enemy, sometimes bringing the Redcoats intelligence about rebel activities. One of Cornwallis' Hessian corporals marveled at the Virginians' change of heart. Toward us, meaning the Portsmouth garrison, they were rather agreeable and showed more respect than in other provinces, especially the Virginia women had more affection for the Germans. Some things never change, uh, at least to true priorities. The fetus sentiment reached such dangerous levels that Richard Henry Lee recommended that General Washington returned to Virginia with his troops and assume dictatorial powers until the crisis passed. Thomas Jefferson seemed to echo Lee's thoughts when he urged Washington to hasten to the Old Dominion, quote, to lend us your personal aid, end quote. For Jefferson to even hint at such an illiberal expedient, the situation in Virginia must have appeared close to hopeless. Fortunately for the rebels, Cornwallis' immediate superior, Sir Henry Clinton, was a jealous neurotic. Suspecting the Earl's success might precipitate his own removal, Clinton brought Virginia's agony to a premature end. In the middle of the summer, Clinton ordered Cornwallis to retire to the coast, set up a naval base, and send 2,000 troops back to New York. Cornwallis began entrenching at a place called Yorktown on the York River on August 2nd, 1781. Now fate turned against the British. At the end of August, a French fleet appeared off Chesapeake Bay, denying Cornwallis access to the sea. Seizing this opportunity, Washington pulled out of his lines around New York and slipped down to Virginia with a strong Franco-American army. By September 28, 1781, Cornwallis and his 6,000 weary regulars found themselves besieged by nearly 17,000 Americans and Frenchmen. Cornwallis knew he was in a tight spot. Hoping to stretch his provisions until Clinton came to the rescue, the Earl ordered all but 2,000 of the slaves with his army expelled from Yorktown. Besides being terrified at the thought of returning to their vengeful masters, many of the cast-off blacks were seriously ill. They had contracted smallpox in the Earl's camps. Frightened by what the future might bring and weakened by disease, hundreds of runaways simply lay down in the no man's land between the opposing trenches, where they died of exposure, illness, and starvation. The remainder took shelter in the woods around Yorktown. Few survived to witness Cornwallis' surrender on October 19, 1781. Thomas Jefferson later claimed that 27,000 of the 30,000 fugitive slaves died of diseases brought to Virginia by the British. Cornwallis had received an inkling of the bleak future in store for his black allies months before he was trapped at Yorktown. Within weeks of Cornwallis' arrival in Virginia, the blacks following the British began exhibiting the unmistakable symptoms of smallpox. On June 18, 1781, the Earl's headquarters advised the Army's different departments who have Negroes in their employ to get them inoculated. The same day, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Dundas, one of Cornwallis' brigade commanders, cautioned his officers, returns to be given in by the 43rd, 76th, and 80th regiments as soon as possible of the number of men in the regiments who have not had the smallpox, and as a number of Negroes belonging to the army now have the smallpox, and a number going to be invalided, it is recommended to such men as never had such disorder to avoid communicating with all Negroes until such a proper opportunity shall be found to have them inoculated. 
Inoculations were administered to the troops, but it is not clear if runaway slaves received the same treatment. What is clear is that smallpox was soon running rampant among those African Americans who were exposed to the Earl's redcoats, Hessians, and Royalists. Lieutenant William Feltman of Brigadier General Anthony Wayne's uh, Pennsylvania uh, Continental Brigade, which shattered British movements in late June, found the enemy's route of march littered with sick and abandoned blacks. He described them as starving and helpless, begging of us as we passed them, for God's sake, kill them, as they were in great pain and misery. Feltman accused the British of frequently leaving black smallpox victims in their wake in order to prevent the Virginia militia from pursuing them. Above 700 Negroes had come down the river in the smallpox. Major General Alexander Leslie, the commander of the British garrison at Portsmouth, wrote Cornwallis on July 13, 1781. Leslie was cold-hearted enough to continue to use the stricken blacks as military assets. I shall distribute them, he informed Cornwallis, about the rebels meantime. After Cornwallis decided to concentrate his forces at Yorktown, he detailed Brigadier General Charles O'Hara to oversee the evacuation of Portsmouth. A warm and friendly Irishman, O'Hara sent his commander a heart-rending report on the rapidly deteriorating condition of the post's black population. I shall continue to receive your positive instructions to the contrary, to victual the sick Negroes above 1,000 in number. They would inevitably perish if our support was withdrawn from them. The people of this country are more inclined to fire upon than receive and protect a Negro whose complaint is the smallpox. The abandoning of these unfortunate beings to, the, to, the, to disease, to famine, and what is worse than either, the resentment of their enraged masters, I should conceive ought not to be done if it can possibly be avoided, or in a small degree as the cases will admit. O'Hara's words touched, touched the Earl, but the latter did not want the epidemic raging at Portsmouth to infect his army at Yorktown. It is shocking to think of the state of the Negroes, Cornwallis confided to O'Hara on August 7, 1781, but we cannot bring a number of sick and useless ones to this place. Some flour must be left for them, and some people of the country appointed to take charge of them to prevent their perishing. Ten days later, O'Hara added the postscript to this tragic story, which proved to be a foretaste of the tragedy that would engulf a much larger, engulf a much larger number of runaway slaves at Yorktown. We shall be obliged to leave over 400 Negroes, 400 wretched Negroes. I have passed them all over to the Norfolk side of the Elizabeth River, which is the most friendly quarter in our neighborhood. I have begged of the people of Princess Anne and Norfolk counties to take them. We have left with them 15 days provisions, which time will cure, kill or cure the greatest number of them, such as will by that time be free from the smallpox, which is the invincible objection the people have to these miserable beings. For African Americans, the Yorktown campaign was a tragedy. This is not the picture that, that would fill their minds, at least those who survived. What transpired in Virginia in 1781 was the most notable slave uprising to occur in the United States prior to our Civil War. Those blacks who flocked to Cornwallis registered their hatred for chattel slavery and their desire for liberty, a desire so great they willingly braved the dangers of war to realize it. And thousands chose death instead of returning to bondage. Wherever freedom is cherished, their struggle and their betrayal should be remembered. Thank you. I saw uh, the Passion of the Christ, I was so glad he didn't blame the death of Jesus on the British. Uh, <laughs> but he found somebody else. Uh, you know, Gibson, uh, like any, any filmmaker, is trying to make a film that would be palatable to, to mass audiences, so he's going to, uh, he's going to change history. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, the people working on, uh, on, on, on 
the, the American Heroes Plantation. They're not really slaves. They're getting paid wages. I don't think that fellow's neighbors would have been too happy about that because that would have been causing additional discontent among their slaves. Uh, and, and yeah, again, you know, the, uh, the on the other hand, the British, you know, made use of blacks not because, for the most part, of some humane um, impulse, but because they proved to be a military asset. But yeah, I mean, uh, Gibson certainly makes it look like his, you know, slavery wasn't such a bad thing, at least when the, when the character played by Mel Gibson was was involved in it. So that's that's certainly, uh, and, and again, you know, uh, the the fact that large numbers of blacks would flock to the British uh, because they saw that as a way out, not because they were loyal to the king. I'm sure, uh, again, would indicate that that most of them weren't too happy to be slaves, and if they had if they had the option, that they would they would exercise to get out. And there were others who, who exercised that option uh, by, by siding with the Continental Forces, too. Uh, but that also included large numbers of freemen uh, who, uh, I'm sure, uh, were, were politically loyal to the, uh, to the cause. We're about, uh, estimate is 5,000 uh, African Americans served with the Continental Army during the War of Independence. And you had large, large numbers intermixed in, in, in the New England Army and, and, and New England militia units as well. So it, it was, you know, they were on, they were on both, both sides of the line. And, and uh, uh, we need to uh, broaden our view of that aspect of American history. It was a bit more complicated, a bit more complicated than, than movies could ever do justice to. But that's true of any historical era. Hey, Greg, uh, from somebody who's looking at similar trying to learn lessons from counterinsurgency right now. What did the, how did the British Army perceive, did they bring any lessons at all from Carl Wallace's campaign? And what happened to Carl Wallace and Tom after the war? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Carl Wallace is improvising. He's improvising, and, and, and because this doesn't work in the end, because no matter what the British do during the revolution, you know, they suffer from what unfortunately has become a chronic problem in, in our own experience, a lack of boots on the ground. So even when they're doing well, it doesn't take that much to turn it topsy-turvy. Uh, and uh, you know, Cornwallis has found a way to, to check resistance in Virginia, but all it takes is a Yorktown, and that's wiped clean. And um, you know, I don't think he thought out what kind of new world order <laughs> would exist in the South if he was successful. Uh, because, I mean, the, the, the people who flocked to him for uh, seeking their freedom, they weren't going to go back to being slaves again, even if Mel Gibson paid them. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's just, he's, he's, he's trying something new because the other stuff hasn't worked. And um, when it all falls apart, um, I mean, he didn't get Sir Henry Clinton's, I don't, he didn't inform Sir Henry Clinton about, about using the black population. Uh, you, you learn that from the orders to his army and, and from, the letter, from the letters and the orderly books and the diaries and the memoirs, the people who were there, uh, pension records of Continentals, who saw all these blacks around the British lines and uh, later offered money by slaveholders to try and help them recover their slaves. Washington is issuing orders after, you know, the, the army that won our independence uh, within a couple of days of the British surrender, Washington is issuing orders, turning his army into an army of slave catchers. Hey, if these blacks are telling you they're free, uh, that's not true. Bring them to the central location where uh, masters can come to search out their and recover their, recover their property. Cornwallis is going to uh, uh, defend himself from, from Clinton's charges that he disobeyed orders by marching into Virginia and lost the war through, 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 through recklessness. Uh, and, and he'll end up getting away with it. He was better liked than Clinton. And he will be given a, a, a couple of chances to rehabilitate his reputation. He'll be sent to India, uh, where he'll um, defeat uh, the forces of, of Tapu, Tapu Sultan in one of the Mysore Wars, I think is the third. Uh, then he'll be in Ireland in 98, and he'll put that down. But he learned something about winning hearts and minds. I mean, the British are pretty ruthless in putting down the 98. But after it's over, Cornwallis tells the king and, and the ministry, if you want to keep Ireland, you have to uh, give these people Catholic emancipation. You cannot treat them like pariahs in their own, their own homeland. You've got to make them subjects or citizens. And when the king and the government refuse, he resigns. Okay, 
<laughs> if you don't really don't want to win their loyalty, then you know it's, uh, I'm not going to keep killing them for you. And he'll, he'll uh, negotiate, I think, the peace on the on uh, with uh, Napoleon, uh, creating one of the momentary lulls in, in, the, in the last of the great wars between France and England. And he'll be ordered back to India one last time, and he'll die right after he gets there. So he was a man who had a very strong sense of duty. I mean, he had a strong ego, uh, like a lot of army commanders, uh, but he had a very strong sense of duty. I mean, he, he didn't approve of British tax policies, but when the king asked him to go to North America, even though his wife was ailing, he went. Uh, and, and he got back to England uh, for leave, and she died, and he went back because he said, you know, this is all I have in my life. And, and he believed in, 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 in sacrificing everything. Uh, for the king, uh, for the cause, and he thought everyone else should should act that way too. Tarleton. Uh